welcome to this quick podcast on tips for improving your biliary ultrasound. By this time, you should have watched other videos and podcasts and had some exposure to biliary ultrasound yourselves. So a couple of quick facts. The first is that CT will routinely miss about 25% of gallstones. And that's why it's important to, to do your biliary ultrasound. We're actually really good at biliary ultrasound. The typical emergency physician uh, will identify stones 9 out of 10 times and will be correct about 9 out of 10 times. And it's important to do that in the ED. Have you guys ever gotten a, a formal biliary ultrasound reading that said we couldn't test for sonographic Murphys because of pre-medication? Well, it's important to get the sonographic Murphys because that, along with the presence of gallstones, has the highest positive predictive value for acute cholecystitis. So it's important that we do that in the ED. Other factors that can uh, give you a false negative in terms of a sonographic Murphys is if they have uh, chronic diabetes, if they have chronic cholecystitis, or if there's a perforation of their gallbladder already. With diabetes and chronic cholecystitis, you can actually have damage to the nerves that innervate the gallbladder wall, and that's why the sonographic Murphy tends to be less reliable. So why is it so hard to do biliary ultrasound? Well, first, most of our patients that have cholelithiasis, um, they tend to have generous BMIs. Second, you're dealing with a lot of bowel gas around the same area that you're doing your biliary ultrasound. So here's your gallbladder, and all of this is duodenum or transverse colon. You also have ribs that are on top, so that also limits your view of of your gallbladder. Um, so that's why it's important to, to adequately position your patient. The first thing is actually to raise their bed to about your hip level. This will minimize your back strain. Oftentimes it'll take a few minutes at least to do a, a good biliary ultrasound, so you don't want to be straining your back and rushing during this exam. Second, you can flex the patient's knees and that will loosen the rectus muscles so that you can compressed bowel gas a little bit more uh, with this maneuver. Third, you can put the patient in left lateral decubus position. That tends to displace the bowel a little bit so that uh, you, you're dealing with less bowel gas interference. And probably the most important uh, trick that you can do is actually to have the patient take a deep breath and hold it. This will displace the diaphragm inferiorly as well as the liver and the gallbladder. And a lot of times you can get a really good subcostal view with this maneuver. Speaking of imaging, it's important to get the gallbladder in two planes, a, a short and a long axis. The short and long axis do not refer to your body axes. They're not sagittal or transverse views per se, but they refer to the actual gallbladder. Just like when you do a focused cardiac ultrasound, you're referring to the parasol long as the true long axis of the heart, as well as the short as the short axis of the heart. Next, you want to be able to identify the fundus of the gallbladder, as well as the body and the neck. You want to fan through the gallbladder completely so that you can identify any gallstones. And you want to identify that anterior wall, or the nearest wall to the ultrasound probe, and make sure that it's less than four millimeters. And you also want to identify the presence of any wall edema or any pericolcystic fluid or PCF. And if you can identify the common bowel duct, you want to make sure that it's less than 7 millimeters in diameter. Remember that with um, age above 50, you can add 1 millimeter per decade. So the techniques, first is the subcostal sweep. The subcostal sweep, you actually go underneath the costal margin and you get the gallbladder most of the time from fundus to body to neck. The great advantage for a subcostal sweep is that you can actually perform a sonographic Murphy's because you can actually identify that fundus and put some pressure on it. The major con to this, this technique is that there's a lot of bowel gas in the way. The next technique is called the X-7. And essentially, it's an intercostal view of the gallbladder. You count about seven centimeters lateral to the xiphoid process, and that's where you put your probe. In someone with a larger BMI, you may actually do an X minus 10. The last view is the axillary view, 
and it's basically a coronal view of the gallbladder from like a right upper quadrant and you can also get a pretty good view of the gallbladder with less gas um, it's also an intercostal view so you have to avoid rib shadowing and just like the X-7 there's no way you can do a sonographic Murphy's so this is subcostal sweep again so you start underneath the xiphoid process kind of angle a little bit and just go underneath the costal margin this is the X-7 you go about seven centimeters lateral to the xiphoid process you put your probe down and it's essentially an anterior posterior view of your body and then your axillary view is when you actually go to the side mid or posterior axillary line so sometimes you can't find the gallbladder and uh, there are a couple of different reasons first if they've actually had it taken out you're obviously not going to have any luck uh, second usually what we deal with is um, someone who's morbidly obese you just have a hard time finding it uh, along with bowel gas in the way the third reason if it's a contracted gallbladder um, you will see this in a second and the fourth is something called the west sign which we'll talk about too so a contracted gallbladder typically occurs because of the release of CCK and you have the smooth muscle on the wall actually contracting so that the lumen is essentially obliterated um, the actual diameter of the gallbladder in the short axis is usually less than one centimeter and it can look very sliver like because the smooth muscle of the gallbladder wall is contracted it can appear that the wall is actually thickened when in fact it's just a contracted wall Actually, I'm pretty relieved when I see this on ultrasound because it means that the patient just ate about an hour or two prior to uh, my evaluation. And usually they'll tell me that their pain has been relieved as well. So it makes for an easy discharge. This is the west sign. It's the wall echo shadow. So you have the anterior wall right here. You have the echo of the stone itself. And then you have the shadowing right here. So you actually don't see the posterior wall of the gallbladder. And you typically see this only in the short axis view of, of the gallbladder. And sometimes people look at this and they say, you know, is that a rib underneath? Because it looks like uh, a short axis of some sort of bone. Uh, but it's not. It's, it's the, the west sign. So if you see that, you know, one thing that you could do is just to rotate the, your indicator 90 degrees and you usually will get a long axis view of the gallbladder and you can see the stone very well. A tip to finding the gallbladder, so you first want to identify the portal vein. The portal vein is the only structure that you have in the liver that actually has hyperechoic walls. That's about one centimeter in diameter. You can look at the death marks on the right side of the screen and you can see that uh, each individual space is about one centimeter so if you look for a vessel that has hyperechoic walls that's about one centimeter that's the portal vein once you have the portal vein into view what you need to do is then just rotate the probe to find the the main lobar fissure and the main lobar fissure is this white or hyperechoic uh, linear structure right here and once you have that into view you just need to kind of fan or toggle the probe very, very carefully, and then you'll get the gallbladder and long axis. And this is typically referred to as the exclamation mark sign. And the reason why this works is that you have the portal vein uh, that's entering the liver. This is called the portal hepatis. And if you find that and you um, kind of rotate the probe a little bit, you'll find the, the main lobar fissure, which the green arrow points to. And then once you find that, all you need to do is just do a little bit of fanning or tilting of the probe and you'll find the, the gallbladder and long axis as well. This is a Mickey Mouse line. Remember the portal triad with the pack artery as well as the, the bowel duct and um, this is what we see right here. We see the portal vein, we have a stone in the bowel duct on the left side and then the hepatic artery is on the right. So how can you tell the difference? You can put on color Doppler and that will help you to differentiate the hepatic artery from the common bowel duct. So the bowel duct is on the left side, whereas the hepatic artery is on the right. This is another view where the portal vein is down below. Remember, it's about a centimeter in diameter. And you have a pulsating object that is right here. This is the hepatic artery. And this is a bowel duct. If you guys note, this is about one centimeter in diameter. So this person has bowel duct dilatation. 
The fourth tip is to always image the neck. So this is a classic reason. You can see that if you just kind of get the short axis um, at the level of the fundus of the body, you don't see anything. But right here, you see a big stone at the neck. The fifth tip, especially when you have a lot of bowel gas um, and you're not sure if there, it's a stone or not, is always to get two planes, two orthogonal uh, or perpendicular planes to evaluate for an intraluminal process or something that is extraluminal. So here we see something that looks like uh, possibly a stone versus bow gas. And when we go to the short axis, we see that basically there's nothing that's interluminal, that it's all bow gas surrounding. So this is how you can confirm that there's not a stone. And in fact, it's just bow gas. So that's it. Hopefully um, you can apply these tips the next time you do biliary ultrasound. If you have any questions, just don't hesitate to contact me. This is my email address, and this is our website below right here. It has a lot of links to great clinical resources and resources for ultrasound.